Hi, everyone. I'm Johnny with the Psychedelic Society of Texas. I'd like to thank you all for coming out to this event. I'd like to thank Angel and Angie, with Angie, she's in the back, from the Central Texas Psychological Society um, for this talk on fungi art and the war on nature. Um, now, since this is a Psychedelic Society of Texas event, I do have to read a disclaimer. Um, Sites does not hold ceremonies or promote illegal activity during our event. This is not a place to seek, encourage, or participate in the procurement of controlled substances. Uh, you agree that you will not contact us for such things and will not engage in any such events uh, in your participation in any side event. We provide a platform to discuss experiences that offer transformation in our personal and professional lives. And you acknowledge that any information we provide is for educational purposes only and not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Um, so thank you all again for coming out. Part of our mission is to um, bring to light the healing uh, benefits of psychedelics. Um, and so with that, we want to invite you all to some of our upcoming events. Um, Sunday, April 23rd, we're having an in-person integration circle in Austin, Texas. Um, online on Monday, April 24th, there is an integration circle for bloomers or boomers and late Gen Xers. Um, on Online, awake and activate a guided breathwork journey. Um, and then, if you're in, in going to be in Houston on Sunday, April 20th, um, there's going to be a talk by uh, Graham Jin on psychedelic legis legislation in the state of Texas. So, um, if you're not a member of Psychedelic Society of Texas, you can come catch up with us afterwards and join and register on the site. Um, but again, thank y'all for coming out, coming out, and I'll hand it over to Angel. Okay. Yeah. okay, hey everybody, thank you so much for making out the beautiful South Town today. My name is Roxy and I work with Angie and Angel and the Central Texas Mycological Society and we do a lot of the programming here in San Antonio. So if you have any ideas or you want to learn more, please reach out to Angie and myself and we'd be happy to myceliate with you. We're really excited for this talk today. And Angel, Angel Chastity is a forager, an urban homesteader, and a mycophile. And she serves as one of the lead organizers for Central Texas Mycological Society. She's an inspiring and passionate educator. She strives to make mycology accessible to everyone. So without further ado, Angel. Y'all. Feels super important in this uh, Britney Spears <laughs> So yeah, thanks everybody for coming out. Love coming down to San Antonio to my affiliate with you all. And so, as Roxy was saying, um, you know, I um, one of the lead organizers of Central Texas Mycological Society, and I love gardening and foraging. But um, I'm, I want to note that I'm self-taught. Um, you know, I'm an enthusiast. Uh, some people call it call you uh, use the terminology uh, amateur. That's kind of got like the negative weight, like that word does <laughs> these days. But um, uh, I have so much more to learn about fungi, so I'm going to tell you all a little bit about me to start off with um, some of my selfies here. And so I live in Austin, and I worked in tech for about 15 years, and I was doing animation for the web and experience design, and um, I grew up in the Midwest, and so I uh, was part of a very large family, pretty unconventional, about 13, a family of 13, same parents, uh, so they had 11 children, um, and my interest in mushrooms started pretty young. Um, my, my grandparents had a flashcard set and it had the destroying angel in it. And of course, I was like, that's my name. And I was like, it's so beautiful and it's deadly. I love it. Um, so yeah, I was really drawn to that like paradox. And um, and so uh, we all would also go out and hunt for morels, which is what happened this time of year in the Midwest. I don't know if anybody here has been to, this, been to those regions or lived in those regions, but morels were a really big deal. So that was another mushroom that I had a lot of uh, kinship with, and so um, I found my first Texas morale when the pandemic kind of shut everything down, and uh, there was nothing to do but turn off the news and go outside. <laughs> you all probably remember that. Um, so I found my 
first Texas morels, just getting outdoors and kind of tuning in and dialing in to the outdoors even more. Um, and so uh, additionally, another mushroom that I really uh, have kinship with is um, the psilocybin mushroom. So in middle school, things kind of broke down in my family and we, all of my siblings and everyone was separated. We were put into foster care. Um, and so I was kind of your typical kind of misanthropic, like disaffected teen. And of course, I gravitated to like um, things that seemed bad, right? Like psilocybin, like marijuana, all those sort of things. So those were my allies. And they were, I didn't realize they were medicine at the time, but, you know, they were, they were, they helped me out. Um, and it was, it helped me cope with like feelings of isolation and separation and abandonment, all those sort of things. So it kind of really broke those, uh, poten the potential for like some uh, pretty serious like trauma like early on. And I'm really glad that I did those things um, now that I know the medicinal benefits. And as we're all learning those uh, medicinal benefits, uh, as sort of we undo the sort of war on drugs. And so um, I'm still working on those sort of things. You know, I still kind of, um, rejected a lot of the things that I learned growing up and they weren't all, you know, good or bad. I was sort of stuck in that binary way of thinking, um, you know, good versus evil, which is really ingrained in our culture. And we'll get into a little bit of that too, like studying uh, art um, throughout history. Uh, but, you know, kind of having that mindset that I really like lost my connection to nature in a way. Um, and kind of came back to it later in my mid-30s and really started investing invest time um, and being able to just slow down, which is definitely a privilege to be able to do, to be able to spend that time outdoors and make connections with allies and um, and find kinship in, in all of living things, really. And so, so yeah, so we're going to get started here on a mushroom journey. So I kind of, uh, I put this talk together before the pandemic, and this is part one. So I didn't really know what kind of rabbit hole I was going to go down. Um, there's about 100 slides in this deck, so you all are going to see a lot of art. Um, and so be sure to kind of write down or just uh, take a note of your questions, and we'll take, we'll have a, a conversation and a Q&A at the end. Uh, but I sort of created this in a way to sort of organize my own disparate thoughts and things that I've been seeing all over the place um, throughout my time, just kind of understanding the use of, of um, ethnogenic mushrooms throughout history. And so it helped me think a little bit more critically about our relationship and especially what Western culture has with the mushrooms. And so part two is where I'm really going to get into some of the like uh, get deep into Western mycophobia, the war on drugs, like how alchemy kind of came to the West and how that was then visually communicated through art and artifacts. And so while it may not seem like super apparent when you look closer, uh, like I did when I was doing all of my research, um, I was finding mushrooms everywhere, like all over the globe. And, um, so it's like a fun little mushroom forage, uh, digging through all of this research of many different historical scholars, and um, you know, it's finding all these historical depictions and cave paintings, petroglyphs, going all the way back 40,000 years, all the way to the uh, European Renaissance. And that's kind of where I stop um, this talk. And so, just keep in mind that many of these artifacts and interpretation, it's through a Western lens. And because of colonization and ecological death, uh, destruction, a lot of that history has been erased. And so that has been told. And there's a lot of things that haven't been translated. And a lot of that history is gone away. So this is in no way like a complete, very high level. Um, and I love when people kind of bring me new things, new papers, and new research. And there's more happening, especially with this uh, sort of revival and interest in ethnogens. And so, so yeah, so keep a look out for part two. And um, we also do all of our talks. Uh, we'll have recordings on our YouTube channel. So if there's something that you want to go back and revisit, feel free to uh, 
to check out our YouTube channel. Smash the like button. Okay, and so as I go through the slides, you'll see early visual languages uh, that were used all over the world. And as we interpret the art, you will see that these mushrooms were sacred um, and were a central component of a lot of religious ceremonies of our early ancestors. And and you'll notice that these art and rituals have many parallels on both sides of the globe. And so here are a few of the mushrooms we'll be discussing. And feel free to shout out some names, common or Latin. Anybody recognize any of these friends, allies? We got some, yeah, Amanita muscaria. There's some, um, I think that the uh, ones in India or Cyanesis, psilocybin, or Solosti, Cyanesis, and then in, on, in North America, you see the uh, Cubensis. And so I'm going to move across the globe in somewhat of a timeline and note that I'm going to be using like modern naming conventions, so don't get too caught up in the technical details. It's just to keep things brief and cover a lot of information. And so um, I'll jump around. I'm also going to throw in some modern anecdotes to kind of bring us back into the present. So, um, so yeah. So for me, it was a really great way to view art. Um, and considering that fungi and mycelium are really foundational to our evolution as a species, and that fungi is our close ancestor, uh, we're very closely related to them um, uh, DNA-wise. Um, they've help make a livable planet. Um, they've helped us cycle through many mass extinctions. And I hope that this talk in inspires you to learn even more about fungi. So we're going to start in India. And so the earliest rock art depicting mushrooms is from the estimated 40,000 years ago in eastern India, where the cow is sacred. So psilocybin. Dionysus, shown here, is commonly found in the Indus Valley, where these petroglyphs that are traced appear and um, to be mushroom people or perhaps spiritual elders of the tribe. And this is the best kind of like tracings I could find. It was hard to find actual some of the worn rocks, and they may be already worn because this is 40,000 years ago. And so as time went on, mushrooms continued to appear in religious art. And above are ceramic female fertility figurines from the Indus Valley from around the 3rd to 2nd century BCE. And they depict multiple Amanita muscaria mushrooms in the headdress of the Earth Goddess. And so the Rig Veda is one of the world's oldest religious Sanskrit texts. And it refers to the legendary food of the gods known as soma over 100 times. And so we are told that drinking soma provides great physical strength to pick the earth up and the power of light to go beyond the limits of heaven and earth. And so we know that soma was a focal point of the Vedic religion and that drinking soma uh, produces immortality. And the gods drank soma to make them immortal. And so the contents of this drink is still debated by many scholars to contain potentially mushroom psilocybin or ergot, which is the precursor to LSD. And uh, some people hypothes hypothesize cannabis. And so um, the Rig Veda describes soma as a small red plant having no leaves, lacking both roots, blossoms and having a stem that is juicy and meaty. And some of the more recent things that I've found, because this is one of the things that people have been going back and forth on since the 60s and 70s, but um, one of the uh, scholars of this region in India, he believes it's a cactus called the Somalata or moon creeper, which is the Latin name. Uh, so yeah, so there's a good Wikipedia page on what plants people theorize, like what plants and what fungi people theorize to be soma. And there's even groups I've seen that are trying to approximate it and hold ceremony um, on in North America. But um, yeah, 
And so this is a figurine of Buddha under a mushroom. And according to legend, Buddha eventually reaches nirvana or enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, but only after he dies from eating a poisonous meal. And it's debated whether Buddha's last meal was mushrooms or wild boar, um, maybe both. <laughs> Sounds like a good meal. And so here are several more figurines of Buddha. And again, we see the mushroom replacing the Bodhi tree that is considered the legendary tree of life. And so above are a few different depictions of Shiva, the auspicious one, and the supreme being in Hindu religion, who creates, protects, and transforms the universe. And there are many depictions of this goddess uh, with what appears to maybe be an Amanita muscaria mushroom. And so here's some ancient murals in India from the 17th century depicting the elders wearing clothes that are kind of encoded with the Amanita muscaria mushroom. So now we're going to go to Siberia. Um, which is almost to the North Pole to approximately 10,000 years ago, where there are petroglyphs in Far East Siberia. And again, you see figures with mushrooms in their heads. And you can make out not only the hemispherical mushroom cap of Amanita muscaria uh, above the females, but you can also see the sort of pointy shape of psilocybin mushrooms on the males. Yeah. And so Amanita muscaria is told to be toxic in the West. And in Siberia, they are still consumed by various tribes during their rituals. And observing this sacred ritual um, was very difficult for curious Westerners. And we now know that Amanita muscaria can be consumed by drying the mushroom to remove the neurotoxin, uh, the ibotenic acids, and converting it to moscow, which is kind of a delirium. Um, and so this is an illustration by a Dutch explorer in the late 17th century, and it's the earliest known depiction to appear in Europe. And it popularized the term shaman. And so take note of the horn um, from the antlers, because that's going to come up again later. And so in the 18th and 19th century, travel writer and scientists from the West described the ritual. And so the most famous account was by Oliver Goldsmith in 1762. And to quote him, um, Verbatim, the poorer sort who love mushrooms to distraction as well as the rich, but cannot afford it at first hand, post themselves on these occasions around the huts of the rich and watch the ladies and gentlemen as they come down to pass their liquor, also known as urine, and hold a wooden bowl to catch the delicious fluid, very little altered by filtration, being still strongly tinctured with an intoxicating quality. Of this, they drink the most utmost satisfaction, and thus they get as drunk and as jovial as their betters. A little, uh, little hierarchy, golden shower, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so reindeer also consume Amanita muscaria. And so writers reported that reindeer urgently sought out human urine, urine, and this greatly helped with the domestication. And so you see an elder here with the reindeer um, watching their behavior after eating a fly agaric mushroom. And these are some beautiful photos taken by, um, I think I had the, uh, the photographer's name in the previous slide. Uh, so the Siberian people also began using dried vent a dried version to enhance their journeys of expanded awareness. And so their spirit journeys were not about escaping reality or, um, or sort of getting high. Um, instead, they used their journeys to seek wisdom and knowledge and honor the spirits of animals, plants, the natural world, and gave, that gave them life. And so by connecting with the spiritual aspects of the world, they gathered information that helped them learn when to hunt, when to gather, 
when to move to other locations, and how to treat illness of their body and soul. And so here is some more modern photos of a seventh generation shaman, Tatiana Yerkenshin. And she is wearing these beautiful polka dot colors of the Amanita or the uh, Mario mushroom or emoji mushroom. And so there's some uh, great videos online where you can see her kind of talking and doing ceremony. Um, and here's a few more examples of some of the clothing from the different tribes in Siberia. And so by studying the history and traditions of the Siberians, uh, some people like to theorize that it's these ancient rituals were appropriated and eventually became the myth of Santa Claus and the, the sort of uh, Judeo-Christian holiday, which is more about consuming material objects rather than communing with nature. And so everything from the location of the North Pole, the timing of the winter solstice, reindeer flying, the red and white colors, finding the gifts or the mushrooms under conifer trees, uh, and having rosy cheeks, which is a side effect of consuming Amanita muscaria, kind of going down the chimney, which is how the shamans enter the hut in the winter, uh, to placing ornaments on the tree, which is how the uh, mushrooms are dried. Um, and so, which is uh, necessary for removing the neurotoxins. And so I have a short little video that was produced by the BBC, and I'm going to see if I can make the sound work. And if we can't, we'll just skip. Okay. Is here that or should I just pause it? A lot of fun. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go to Africa. And I think I'll skip the next video. The sound is just, I don't know why it's not pumped up on the Bluetooth. But um, we're going to go to the Sahara Desert in Africa to a vast plateau in southeast Algeria. Asali in, in Ajir, a national park and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And so this is a cave painting of the bee-headed mushroom man, Matalem Amazar. A large grouping of rocks dating back 7,000 to 9,000 years ago. And so Earl Lee in his book, From the Bodies of the Gods, Psychoactive Plants and the Cults of the Dead, um, explains this imagery that it refers to ancient episodes where a mushroom shaman was buried in his clothes and when earth 
Some time later, his clothes were covered in tiny mushrooms growing in his clothes. There this really is, and um, what makes this mushroom person different from early rock art um, is really the bee head, um, which we know that people had a like you could be a lot of Africa had a big um, allyship with bees and honey. Um, so yeah. I just that's what someone called them. Our homeboy John Tana. Um, he also tells the story of the bee mushroom man when talking about his discovery and finding solutions for colony collapse disorders. Does everybody know about this? Yeah, so he's been working with some researchers um, to understand why bees need trees um, because they need the fungi in their, in their diets. And when we take them out of their ecosystem for our monocultures, um, you know, farms that grow just one thing, you know, the bees then lose their, um, lose their ability to have fungus um, in their diet, which we know helps humans with our immunity, um, but it also helps a lot of living things, including bees, build their immunity. And so when they don't have a strong immune system, the varroa mites, which is one of their parasitic, parasitic um, insects, usually they, if they have a strong immune system, the varroa mites, they, they can, um, you know, kind of uh, brush them off or the, they, they withstand, um, or they, they aren't able to uh, get diseases from the varroa mites. But um, when they, they've done studies where they've added like different kinds of fungi into the diet of uh, bees, they've been able to build up a stronger immune system and stop some of the um, collapse and dying of the bees. And so you can learn more about this project um, on, I think, on Paul Famous website. There's also a project called Bee Mushrooms um, that that was came up was getting started as research before the pandemic. I know things are kind of picking up again, um, from what I've heard at the Tech Mushroom Conference. Uh, so now we're going to go to Egypt to about 5,000 years ago when the pharaohs ruled. And so the ancient Egyptians called mushrooms sons of gods and plants of immortality because they did not have seeds and grow like plants. And so they believed the storm god Set created them by hurling light bulbs to earth. And so hieroglyphs carved some 4,600 years ago depict Set, the storm god, giving mushrooms to pharaohs, as you see here. And so... So it's a common belief that mushrooms come from lightning. And in many cultures, including Japan, um, they actually use electricity in their cultivation. And so a four-year study in Japan in 2007, scientists in Volta injected 50 volts of, into a variety of mushrooms in cultivated plots and logs to see if the electricity would make them grow better. And so eight out of the 10 varieties multiplied, including shiitakes having the best outcome. And if you wanted uh, a link to that paper, I can give it to you. But, but yeah, they were, um, this is something that ancient people, they understood, uh, the sort of nitrogen charging of, of the air with our light. And we all probably noticed too, we have a nice thunderstorm There's mushrooms everywhere, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll get some of that tonight. So yeah, so back to Egypt, uh, mushrooms were cultivated on barley. And so eating mushrooms was an exclusive privilege of the pharaohs, whose uh, well-documented belief in their own divinity and immortality was by consuming psilocybin. And so common men were forbidden from even touching mushrooms. And so this tablet on the left, uh, which is a law that explains this. And so on the right, you see mushrooms coming from behind a female pharaoh. Coming out of her head again or something else. And so the pharaoh Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid of Giza about 4,500 years ago, loved truffles 
and made sure the royal table was always supplied with these rare desert-born fungi. And so this same desert truffle is also mentioned in the Quran. And so you can find um, during the season, I believe it's like around May in that part of the world, uh, desert truffles are about $20 a pound um, in the Middle East, which is quite a lot for their currency. And so, yeah, I've always wondered if they grow in our desert too. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to find them, but um, I'm guessing they're mycorrhizal, and so they have to have a certain kind of tree. But it would be fun to, to look for them. And so, so in the oldest Egyptian writings, the, the pyramid text, that it referenced an unknown red golden plant used in sacred rites. And in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they are called the food of the gods, or celestial food, and also flesh of the gods. And scholars who have studied them closely believe that they're referencing Amanita and Muscaria once again. And so these mushrooms, and some even believe that the ankh, the symbol of the ankh, is a symbol for mushrooms as well. And so mushrooms can be found all over Egypt in old architectures and in mushrooms and mankind. James Arthur says that pillars of tombs in ancient Egypt are also shaped like giant oyster mushrooms. And so this is an example of a wall relief. Um, a mushroom basket that's the Temple of Hathor, and then there's also a relief at the Idfu Temple and a pillar um, with a fan, kind of the oyster shape, on the on the Temple of Sile. And so, a variety of ancient Egyptian texts and art, uh, artworks also hypothesize that the stages of the Egyptian crown is also originally designed to represent. Uh, psychedelic mushrooms, and so shown here you see the white crown next to pinning mushrooms, and then the triple crown like later in the stages of growth. So moving now to Mexico and Central America, uh, over the years scholars have found an abundance of archaeological evidence supporting the proposition that in Mesoamerica, the high cultures of South America and the Easter Island shared, along with many other New World cultures, elements of the mushroom-based belief system. And like the Vedic god Soma of ancient Hinduism. And so here are two figurines from two different parts of the world, goddesses um, in what appear to be the Amanita muscaria mushrooms on the head. And so here's another example of a figurine from India and also from Mexico. And the study of mushroom symbolism in ancient religious art would suggest that the religion of Soma, as well as other Vedic religions, migrated to the Americas sometime around 1000 BCE. And the Indians of the New World modeled their religion on Vedic beliefs and ritual practices. When, while most of the accounts of mushrooms use, use concern the Aztecs, there is evidence that Maya uh, people uh, had mushroom ceremonies in association with the, the so-called uh, mushroom stone cult from Guatemala. And so the practice of burying these stones with shamans um, lasted well into the colonial era. And the mushroom stones were described as symbols of dynastic power in the Mayan Quechua document title um, of the Lords of Onesopuan. Get to saying that right. And so here is another collection of various mushroom stones that were excavated from graves in the 1950s. And the tripod stone carving in the shape of mushrooms bearing the effigies of a jaguar on its face. And the jaguar was a symbol of the underworld in Mayan culture, and it represented the power to face one's fear even when one is confronting an enemy or death. And so moving forward in time to the 16th century in Mexico, this is a statue of Xochitl, the Aztec prince of arts and flowers, 
And this statue was discovered in the slopes of the volcano um, Mount Popocatepe. Am I saying that right? The glyphs depict the morning glory, tobacco, and caps of psilocybin as decorum. So here at first glance is a face of the weeping god, and it gives the illusion of a deity with dangling eyeballs. However, if you look closer, you'll notice that those dangling eyeballs are actually mushrooms. And so above are male and female fertility figurines from the Zacatecas culture in Western Mexico dating to the second century CE. And so the Amanita muscaria mushroom in the head of the male figurine on the left and the breast of the female figurine on the right. Pretty cool. And so three similar but distinct uh, Zacatecas figurines from the second century, all three are encoded with the Amanita muscaria mushrooms as female breasts. So understanding that mushrooms represent eternal life, does this symbolism signify life? I think so. <laughs> so this Maya figurine represents a bearded gnome wearing a hat that is believed to be an upside down or inverted Amanita muscaria mushroom. And so this is actually in the Princeton Art Museum. And we'll talk a little bit about like where a lot of these artifacts are now in the end. And so in Mesoamerican mythology, the dwarf is related to Quetzalcoatl and guides the dead to the underworld. Looks like a pretty cool guy. So now we're going to go to Peru, to pre-Columbian time, where many indigenous cultures lived for thousands of years before Spanish colonizers arrived. And so they worship the sun god Itu, Itu and Pachamama, the earth god. Simu shaman holding mushrooms in both hands. And so this ceramic map depicts the transformation of humans into half men, a half jaguar deity, it was made by ancient Olmec as early as 1200 BC, and an Amanita muscaria mushroom is encoded into the head and nose of the human. The archaeological group where there are also mushroom stones, and the purpose of the site was this. Although some say it is an ancient fertility temple where fertility rites took place. So above, we're looking at a woven textile from the southern part of Peru, where the Paracas cultures live. And here's the pornography, audio, yes. Ceremonial axe and the hand with that is a mushroom shape. And so here's another example. The axe in the hand is called a tumi, and it's a, both a tool and a symbol representing mushrooms, which was used in the rite of human sacrifice to appease Pachamama, the goddess of earth. So here's another example. And so there's plenty of evidence of this so-called, uh, or what's been called, trophy head cult in the archaeological records in South America. And according to Andean researcher Christina Connolly, who actually, I don't know if she's still there, but she's at Texas State, uh, a large number of the decapitated heads have been found in the archaeological excavations in this area of Peru. And at the archaeological site, not far from Lake Titicaca, Several dozen decapitated heads were found in a burial arrangement and a geographic layout that buried alongside drinking vessels, maybe suggesting a ritual soma sacrifice. And so it's also important to understand that these rituals were offerings to gods and that human sacrifice was always consensual. And I know that's like hard for people to understand in Western culture. 
but we'll talk a little bit more about this later. So here's a few more moche vessels from Peru that depict the elders with mushrooms in their head. There's a figure of a healer with a sick child, a portrait vessel um, portrayed wearing a headdress of Amanita muscaria. And so this ceramic mask depicts the transformation of a human into half-human, half-jaguar deity. It was also made by the Olmecs in early 1200 BC. Here's another example, a ceremonial vessel. And so this gold figure was found and stolen by Brigham Young when he thought he discovered Machu Picchu. Um, and just a few years ago, these artifacts that were stored at Yale University were finally returned to Peru. And so you can kind of see the eyes and figures have mushroom shapes. And so moving now to Bolivia in the Lake Titicaca region. So this beautiful set of hand copper appliques covered in gilding in a variety of abstract anthropomorphic forms, what would again appear to be mushroom-shaped people. And so the leftmost figure is a depiction of Pachamama, the goddess of the earth, exalted by many ancient and modern native Andean people. Her radiating and rectangular head make a stylized presentation of great reverence and fear among the ancient people there. And for it was believed that not satisfying her by get, bringing human sacrifice and offering that would bring great devastation on the land. So now to Colombia. And so the Incan people value gold among all other metals and they equated it with their sun god, Inti. And so gold was commonly used in artifacts from funerary wear, jewelry, uh, building materials, and of course, sculptures of deities. And here's a few examples of mushrooms in pre-Columbian art. And so the gold figurines with mushrooms are from the Umbaya culture in southern, or in Colombia. So here's another gold mask with mushroom encoded headdress. And so here are mushroom inspired gold ornaments, most likely worn as a head ornament by an Andean ruler or priest, and the ornament that bears the metaphorical shape of a um, half sliced mushroom, as well as a ritual axe, which were used again in human sacrifice, and it's decorated with imagery reminiscent of the spotted amanita. And so moving now to Europe and the country of Spain, uh, we're going to start at a prehistoric uh, archaeological site of Selva Pascuala. And uh, this is um, some cave paintings found about six to 8,000 years ago. And you can kind of see um, what looks like mushrooms next to a, a, a bowl with some longhorns. So Juan Raiz, uh, an expert on this site, and the late mycologist Gaston Guzman from Mexico, uh, who is the leading authority on psilocybin, suggested mm -hmm. that this um, a post-paleolithic -paleo ritual used the psychoactive drugs, and the mushroom is believed to be um, psilocybin hispanica. And it's also believed that the Saharan and Aboriginal tribes in North America might have been using this mushroom as far back as 9000 BCE. Now we're going to move to Scandinavia. And so the Old North writing it is described, describes the Viking berserkers, the fierce warriors who were known for battling an uncontrollable trance like fury and were alleged to be able to perform seemingly impossible superhuman feats of strength. So they would howl and growl like beasts froth at the mouth and launch an attack in a fit of frenzy. And so some scholars proposed that they 
certain examples of this berserker rage was induced by um, consumption of something, um, either out, huge amounts of alcohol or um, hallucinogenic drugs or amanita. Um, and so some people point to the cast of their bronze swords um, dating back to the 16th and 18th century to be evidence of that. So here's some examples of Viking swords. Like, I think it's just a handle, but I don't know. <laughs> I think they would be pretty like chilled out if they took Amanita. I don't think they'd be going berserk, but I don't know. It's fun to think about. Uh, so now we're going to go to ancient Greece. So here it, we find evidence of mushroom use in the Eleusinian Mysteries. And this was an annual event that lasted 10 days and ran for 2,000 years. And this might be because the agrarian ritual and rites were kept secret amongst its many members. So many influential philosophers that we know names of, such as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, took part in these rituals. And so since the mysteries involve visions and conjuring up the afterlife, some scholars believe the power and longevity of the Eleusinian mysteries comes from the use of psychoactive um, mushrooms. And so on the vine, it appears to be a dotted mushroom shape with dots. And you will see more of this pattern where um, it appears that mushrooms are plants like they had, they had been for many, many centuries. And so there's a new book, I mean, it's kind of newish, just several years old now, but the immortality key really gets into this region of the world and talks about it. And I think that there's even now um, people that are able to do chemists, uh, like uh, chemists are able to look at uh, re residual things on vessels, like from this period to determine like what might have been. Here we see Chrysophone, the daughter of Zeus, and Venus, the under her mother. And so this, this depicts the sexual and the annual celebration where Hades, the god of the underworld, abducts Chrysophone. Myth of her abduction represents her function as the personification of vegetation and regrowth of in spring. So now we're going to go to France. We've got 15, like 20 slides left. This is from the early And so the symbols and rituals had many parallels to Hindus or Rig Veda religion and the ritual of drinking Soma. And so here is a fresco mural of Adam and Eve with the tree of knowledge century chapel. So here to be communion bread, dealt with the concepts of sin, but with the side between good and evil. And so here's another subtitled um, defeat in France. And from the early 12th century, five psilocybin mushroom caps appear to be painted above the youth greeting Jesus. So here is a few of the panels of the Canterbury Psalter, a 12th century manuscript of detailed illustrations from the Old and New Testament. And the manuscript is four pages in front. And we see the sacraments depicted with psychedelics, including the blue staining psilocybin, uh, Amanita muscaria, and here again, Adam and Eve at the Tree of Life, choosing the serpent. Uh, 
wisdom and eternity of the soul. And so here we see panels of various depictions of Jesus, our homeboy with some mushrooms. And so dozens of pages displaying various versions of this stylized tree with a blue trunk perhaps depicted how mushrooms root from the mycelium. And often the mushroom trees are integrated into dramatic scenes showing humans interacting with angels and demons. Here's some examples. Very psychedelic scene. And so here we see Christ offering mushrooms by an antlered shaman in a mushroom grove. And in this this famous illustration um, produced by Julius known um, that appeared in Europe. And so to the right, we actually see an actual photo of the Siberian. And Paris, there's like a horn devil through the religious teachings in the West and as uh, the Catholic Church gained dominance. Um, and so as the Winter Mysteries and the Roman Saturnalia, Christmas. 